Hello everyone and welcome to Lush and Salty Aquariums. My name is Stefan. Thank you for coming to my channel and supporting me in this fabulous hobby. We're in front of my 135 gallon freshwater display tank. It is the crown jewel in my home. It's not in the fish room per se, just around the corner in the dining room so the whole family can enjoy it. And I sure hope they do because I know I do and I love showing it to y'all on, uh, on the fish tubes. This aquarium is, uh, today was my change water day, my maintenance day. And so I did a you know pretty significant uh, production regarding this tank. Did some trimming, pulled out some floating plants, uh, looked at the sump, cleaned that out a little bit. Uh, about an hour's worth of work, uh, typically once a week on this particular aquarium. And I mean, you can see why it's, you know, it's a huge ecosystem. It's heavily stocked, uh, both with livestock and plants. Uh, and so it requires a lot of attention. You know, all my aquariums do. And in the previous video, I, I showed another tank that was heavily stocked. And I talked about, you know, it's a lot of life. Is it worth it? And the answer for me was unequivocally yes. And in this tank, uh, proves that out even further if that's possible. Uh, in this aquarium, I have a host of different species of both invertebrates and fish. Obviously, you can see uh, so many. I'm not sure what your eyes are focusing on. Maybe, maybe we'll definitely take a closer look at some of these wonderful organisms and talk about them as my eyes see fit and, and perhaps that will jive with what you're seeing and what you're experiencing and feeling. You know, with a community tank, you never know what you're going to uh, be focusing on at any given time you look at it. Now, hopefully it's not trouble, you know, a sick fish, aggression, some sort of calamity, a leak, God forbid. Hopefully when you take a gander or when anyone looks at your aquariums and in particular display community tanks with so much different things going on at the same time, you know, they see just something wonderful that captures their eye and, you know, they ask about it. And that's one of my favorite things. I mean, if I worked in a fish shop, my favorite thing would be answering questions from people. I don't think I would ever get tired of that. Uh, I did work in a fish shop for about five weeks but I was let go and, and maybe one day I'll talk about that. Uh, but my favorite part was definitely engaging with the customers. And uh, in some respect, that's what I'm doing right here, right now with you. So without further ado, let's engage, okay? Uh, the first new thing and what my eye uh, looks at is generally the new things to make sure they're adapting. And it's, I've expanded, uh, the red tiger lotus. I had one plant, the bulb broke off during a maintenance change. And while they can grow with just roots alone, uh, it was dying back and I kept it in, but I added a robust new one that I got from my guy at Ocean Design Aquarium on the Northwest side of Chicago. I love that shop, look him up. He's, he's the best in the city. And because I was there, I got two, oh my God. So I put the bulb, down, I literally wrapped a little piece of lead lightly around it and sunk it into a space that was in this driftwood and just dropped the bulb all the way down to the substrate. And that's really all you have to do with these. And, and because it's got uh, pieces of uh, stem work kind of keeping it in, uh, you know, intact there, I'm sure it's going to do just fine. This one here, I have the bulb on the ground. I, I've lightly put a piece of stone on some of the root stock. I want it to take there. That worked last time. As soon as the roots take, I can move that little piece of lava rock and we'll probably be good to go. This is one of the leaves from the uh, red tiger lotus that died back and it has one stem coming out uh, that was halfway up. And before that thing was just shooting out petals to the top. Um, or leaves rather, I'm not sure they're tip, you know, petals, but because of their, that they re remind one of flower petals, but clearly something was wrong. And when that bulb uh, broke off and it's somewhere in this tank and 
and that bulb could uh, and probably will start to grow at some point, but I just don't know where it is. I looked like crazy, couldn't find it. So I bought a couple more Red Tiger Lotus and I'm psyched to see if one or both of these uh, take off. If one does not, no big deal. There's not a loss for other plants uh, to take its place for sure, or even just to keep that spot open as kind of the theater ground for all these lovely fish uh, to parade before me. Uh, so what about all these lovely fish? Okay, so two opaline dorames. People love this fish. You know, I always thought it was one of the more drab aquarium fish in, in this tank, but I'll be damned. And as a, you know, people gravitate to it. One of my daughters says it was her favorite. Um, the blue sort of, uh, well, I, I mean, I call it opaline, but I mean, she loved it. It was her favorite fish of all these like fish. Isn't that something? Like I said, you never know what people are gonna gravitate to. It's one of the joys of aquarium keeping, and in particular, if you're doing a community tank, and double in particular, if you have a big display in your living room or somewhere where uh, people and guests are constantly uh, aggregating. I've got schools of Cardinal Tetras and Harlequin Rasboras. They like to chill together. They represent, you know, the small but fabulous fish in this particular aquarium. And there's a giant monstrous mystery snail. He's sort of having a conversation with that male Bosmani rainbow fish. Look at the wonderful flared orange. That's, you know, it's so easy to tell the males from the females because the females uh, tend to be duller all across their body. Um, they're incredible. and, you, and you want your males to really show color, you gotta have a couple females to give them a, a raison d'etre, <laughs> give them a reason to show off. Um, there's a few angelfish in here, they're doing well. I had a lot of problems with angelfish and I talked about that in previous videos. Parasites, unknown, slow death, blah, blah, blah. It was my nemesis trying to keep these guys, but I, I, was, I was doing so much research and I wanted them so badly. So I have four or five in here now. And uh, this is one that I've had for the longest. And that's a, a female. You can see she's probably carrying eggs. Now this one did have bloat before and that tummy was like twice that size. I've rectified that problem. There were parasites as well. I, I covered that in a previous video and I don't wanna go into it here. This is a happy video for the holidays. There's a classic gold angel veal tail. Um, he or she is, is just lovely, very common, but no less lovely, just as this classic silver angel. Um, iconic, right? That's what you think of when you think of angelfish. Clearly there's all kinds of fabulous new uh, variations and color morphs, but that's what you think of. Uh, speak of the devil, here's one that's almost three times the size and it's a veal tail variant. Now these two have spawned before, uh, I, you know, I didn't try to raise the eggs, but they were doing it on a weekly basis until that uh, insidious parasite hit them. And now I think they're recovering and maybe they'll um, mate again. <laughs> we shall see. What else can I talk about in here? The Millennium Rainbow Fish. All right, look at these. Look at these palm-sized, incredible fire, not fire engine red, but sort of a fiery, full-bodied red, almost like you would see in a live bear, like in a red molly or something, you know, or a black molly, just full color, no blotching, intense. I have three of them. I think the males are uh, more pronounced than the females. So either I have three males or the female that I have is uh, holding her own with the males. So, I mean, I don't know if I have a female. I have three beautiful red fish. That's what I'm trying to say. Now there's a school of the underrated Praycox uh, dwarf neon rainbow fish. Uh, look at those jewels. They're like Christmas ornaments. Uh, they're small, they're inexpensive, they're schooling fish. They're almost like the closest thing to a tetra in a rainbow fish. I just love them. Um, and you know, you want to have a group for sure. The more the merrier. If I didn't have any other fish in this tank and like 500 of those, well, 200, that would be something, right? Um, 
This is a young male Bosmani rainbow fish. I got that from my friend Dan at Sydney's Angels. Um, these are from the Rosario Le Quartz train. That's what he told me. I have no reason to doubt it. Um, this guy is still a juvenile, but look at how colorful he is already. Just magnificent. Rainbow fish are my new best friends. I love them to death. Um, let's, let's see what I can talk about down at the ground level. There's all sorts of ancestrous catfish in here. And I see one right there. This is sort of a classic uh, bristle nose. I'm not sure, it looks like a long fin. Looks like a straight ahead, regular uh, bristle nose pleco, but I did put some peppermint and other uh, species in here. And I'm not an expert and I certainly don't know the L numbers. I think that's just a long fin standard uh, bristle nose plecostomus. Um, don't mean to make you into a common critter, you're fabulous. Just stay that way, baby. I've got a bunch of those in here. Um, usually, you know, if I'm feeding, which goes kind of as an obvious statement, they'll all come out and every fish goes nuts. Um, there's a red male, a uh, super red. Whoop, sorry, Charlie. He just uh, hustled back into his cave. Now look, I want to show you this. That's a baby. I've got about five I've counted. Um, and that's not a virus or anything. That's actually just the light there. See, hitting through all these plants. Um, my pleco spawned within the network of this driftwood and this hardscape. I found I find them now, small ones here, there, and everywhere, cleaning the wood, um, coming out, being adorable. I am a little afraid of what I'll do when when I can't catch those suckers, you know, in a straightforward way. But I'm not at that place yet. I'm just happy to see a spawn without even trying. Well, those are easy fish for breeders, I know that. But for me, in a community tank, it was exciting. This is an albino, or a lemon, or an albino. Is it a red eye? Mm, it's hard to tell. Hard to tell whether that's a lemon blue eye or a standard albino version of the strain. It's funny when I watch British YouTubers, they say albino, 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 potato, potato. There's a mystery snail. There's a mystery snail. Where is he? There is he, there is he there. Boom. I'm running CO2. You can see one of the Jardley uh, cups here at this end. There's another one at the other end. You need a lot of, uh, you need to figure out a plan if you want to put CO2 into a big aquarium like this. So I did a double uh, a valve down on a, big, a five gallon or five pound canister down below and I split the valve so there's one on each side. And the plants seem to be doing fabulous. I mean, it, look, <laughs> I pull out a ton of this uh, water lettuce and frog bit every week uh, because that's what happens when you keep this plant. I've got um, jungle veil in the back, corkscrew veil. I've got different anubias and sword plants, as I like to say, in betwixt and between. The, there's a great looking Amazon sword, you know, right in the center, sort of where you want it. It has, it would be a signature or a feature plant if this tank weren't so uh, kind of vibrant in, in every nook and cranny, right? Your eye does not uh, go to any one given thing, which is sort of what's so fun about this aquarium. Maybe it violates certain aquascape rules, but I'll be damned if it isn't a thing of beauty. I wonder, I mean, I suppose I'm asking you to comment, but like, what do you see when you look into this aquarium? I've only covered a fraction of it. Let me, before I sign off, look at all this Bucephalandra. Finally, I've gotten this, you know, lovely plant to find its happy place in my aquariums. Usually it just doesn't compete as well with all the other epiphytes. Um, and, and really all the other plants, things, you know, it's a slow grower, but it's found its, its niche here, its niche, niche, niche. Um, here I am with the grammar lesson, apologies. And I'm, I'm happy to find it in there. And now this is Hygrophilia coriambosa, that plant right there. It, it, 
it'll die, it'll look bad at the bottom and robust at top. So I just cut the tops off and stick them at any bald spot, right? If only I could do that with my own bald spot. And so for about five months, this will grow up to the top. Then the same phenomenon will happen and I'll just chop off the ugly bottom part and restick the bottom somewhere. That's pogo stem and octopus. It's a great kind of filler plant in here. In my other aquariums, it dominates. But in here, I can use it as sort of uh, filler, right? And that's, you know, who's to say? Now this, this uh, cryptocorn with the variegated leaves, that's Balance, one of the longest, most elegant cryptocorns there, uh, there is. And it took a while, but now I've got all kinds of new plants and I do pull them out. I bring those to my swaps and stuff because people will trade for that plant. It's desirable and gorgeous when you can get healthy tank grown specimens. Um, here you see where the Vallisneria is going to town. A lot of people think you can't just uh, clip that at the, at the leaf, I do. I, when it gets way too long, like see that strand just reaching all the way across, I can cut it right there with the scissors and it'll be fine. There might be a little rotting at the very edge, but the next day when I come and look, I don't see anything but more Vallisneria. So whether it continues to grow or whether that cutting just encourages uh, three more to, to erupt from the bottom there, I, you know, I don't know, but I know that you can cut it there and I recommend it because if it keeps on flapping over and over, it will block the light and just become too dominant and it seems to be happy getting haircuts so you know why the hell not here's some uh cryptocorn wendetti probably because there's green and red ver variations of that uh, lovely plant and once crypts get going um, they're wonderful they're slow growing they form their own kind of uh, see-through carpet right it's not a carpet in the traditional sense of the word but you get that like cro close crop jungle effect which I think is fabulous. Either, like if that was your what you're looking at right here, if that was basically your 10 gallon, your 20 gallon tank, it's wonderful. But when it's uh, a part of a massive scape like this, still wonderful. Um, Cryptocorn used to be my favorite uh, species of plant. Obviously there's plenty of species within the crypt family, but um, I love them all, and the balance uh, is a more of an exotic, at least for me it is. And that other one, not so much. There's a couple bristle nose chilling. I don't think those are the parents of the uh, dark colored ones, but you never know. A red and a brown can create an albino. I mean, they all carry the gene for the different color morphs. And I've, I'm pretty positive that it almost doesn't matter which two parents, uh, if you're buying like from swaps and from, you know, fish stores, you never know out of your 20, 40 fry, uh, what uh, color forms you're gonna get. There is a uh, beautiful, I think that's a Farawala catfish. Look at that, isn't that intense? Um, when people see that, that's a showstopper. It's like a, it's from the dinosaur age. And look at that filamentous tail. Nothing ever picks on it. That, that thing, the tail alone is bigger than the fish itself. I've got a couple of those in here as well as other uh, cousins of, this, of that particular fish. And I even suspect there were some breeding because I saw some tiny ones in there. And, you know, sometimes my brain plays tricks on me and I'm like, did I buy a couple of those at a swap or at Ocean Design or at Fish Planet? And I, I, I tell myself, no, they, those are babies, but, you know, there's a lot going on in this tank, I guess is one way to put it. Um, yeah, I tried to sign off five minutes ago, but I didn't. We've got four Bolivian rams. Uh, two males and two females, they occupy the lower portion of the canopy. I don't know if any of those, there's a baby um, pleco right there. To me, that looks so black with the white spots. It looks almost like a peppermint, but it has that distinctive sort of stripe at the end. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd love it for a peppermint. You know, that's more exotic, rarer, more interesting fish than a straight up plecostomus. But... 
Either way, uh, they're in here and they're they're here to stay. You know, how would I catch that if I wanted to? You know, with a trap, probably my best bet. Okay, I tried to sign off once or twice already, so I beg your pardon. Want to wish you all a wonderful new year um, with health and happiness, and and always keep your hands in the in the fish tank, folks. I mean, I, technically you're not supposed to do that, but it's my de facto theme line, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I love you all. Thank you. Ciao for now.